Sometimes if you are, you know, skeptical of social justice activists and you hear them throwing around the word intersectionality a lot, you might think, oh, this is just a bunk idea. But in reality, there's more to it than you think. Chris Martin with us on Heterodox Out Loud. Today's show is our second episode about intersectionality, an academic theory that began with important facts but slowly began turning into an unhelpful ideology. I'm Zach Rausch. This episode is meant for both academics on the progressive left and those on the political right. Our guest, Chris Martin, is an HXA co-founder and a psychologist at Oglethorpe University. He argues that the academic theory intersectionality, if understood properly, can help us understand true and valuable aspects of social life. But to understand properly, it will require those on the left and the right to concede a few critical points. Chris's blog is called Intersectionality is a Political Football. Here's why it doesn't have to be. Before our discussion, here's his blog, read by Richard Davies. It's easy to think of human problems as cumulative. If Bob lives in a Mississippi floodplain, Phil lives near the San Andreas Fault, and you live in an area that's prone to both earthquakes and floods, you should cumulatively have both Bob's problems and Phil's problems. Social problems, however, don't always accumulate that way. The problems of being an African-American woman are not simply the sum of the problems faced by the average African-American and the average woman. Similarly, the problems of being a poor immigrant are greater than the cumulative sum of the problems faced by the average poor person and the average U.S. immigrant. The term intersectionality was coined to describe this phenomenon. The term interaction effects could have been used. It's a non-ideological, non-partisan term that had been in use since the 1930s. But in the early stages, intersectionality scholars weren't using statistics. In fact, the term intersectionality originated in legal scholarship. It is only in the last 10 years that intersectionality has spread from the legal arena and become a political football in American universities. Progressives tend to argue that everything must be intersectional, and conservative skeptics counter that intersectionality is bunk. My goal in this blog post is to explain how progressives and conservatives are both mistaken about the promise of intersectionality. Progressives have adopted an overambitious model of intersectionality in which everyone lies on axes of oppression. And I will explain this model's three flaws. Conservatives generally believe that intersectionality is useless, but I explain how intersectional scholarship can be useful to researchers regardless of whether they are liberal, centrist, conservative, libertarian, or eclectic. The History In 1976, Emma de Graffenreid, a black woman employed by General Motors, sued her employer for discrimination. Along with several co-workers, she accused GM of discriminating against black women by making it impossible for them to get a certain class of jobs. At GM, women were only considered for a certain set of jobs, such as secretarial ones. Blacks were only considered appropriate for another set of jobs, primarily manual factory work. The combined effect was to limit black women's opportunities for advancement in a unique way that was experienced neither by black men nor by white women. Sadly, de Graffenreid's lawsuit failed. The court believed that GM could be sued for sexism for problems that affected all women employees and that it could be sued for racism for problems that affected all black employees. Plaintiffs, however, could not combine racism and sexism. If only black employees of a certain gender or only female employees of a certain race suffered discrimination, GM was not liable for racism nor sexism. The court stated, quote, The initial issue in this lawsuit 
is whether or not the plaintiffs are seeking relief from racial discrimination or sex-based discrimination. The plaintiffs allege that they are suing on behalf of black women and that therefore this lawsuit attempts to combine two causes of action into a new special subcategory, namely a combination of racial and sex-based discrimination. The court notes that plaintiffs have failed to cite any decisions which have stated that black women are a special class to be protected from discrimination. The court's own research has failed to disclose such a decision. The plaintiffs are clearly entitled to a remedy if they have been discriminated against. However, they should not be allowed to combine statutory remedies to create a new super remedy which would give them relief beyond what the drafters of the relevant statutes intended. Thus, this lawsuit must be examined to see if it states a cause of action for race discrimination, sex discrimination, or alternatively either, but not a combination of both. Unquote. In a Law Journal article, Kimberly Crenshaw, a young law professor at the time, wrote about how the black female plaintiffs in de Graffenreid v. General Motors and two similar cases were at the intersection of female and black, as in a Venn diagram, and coined the term intersectionality. Psychologists and biologists had been studying intersections since the 1930s or earlier, but they used the label interaction effects. There was no interaction effects theory because it would have been pointless to bundle all of the psychological and biological domains in which you find interaction effects, those domains having nothing in common. Interactions is also a statistical term, and Crenshaw's argument was not statistical. It was an evidentiary set of case studies showing that discrimination against black women could not incur a penalty in the extant legal framework because it did not violate laws against sex-based or race-based discrimination. Intersectionality had progressive roots but was not laden with ideology. Thus, academic intersectionality could have remained rooted in empirical research with findings and arguments that could potentially persuade people of any ideology. However, intersectionality started to merge with progressive ideology when Patricia Hill Collins, a black feminist sociologist, moved the theory from grounded specificities to ungrounded generalities. In the long term, this deeply ideological term has been bad for academic scholarship because it started to decouple intersectionality theory from research. Collins moved the discussion to general axes of oppression, classism, racism, sexism, heterosexism, and the like. In Collins' theory, the intersection of any two axes creates a unique multiplicative problem that cannot be predicted from additively processing, say, racism and sexism. Unhelpfully, Collins also treats intersectionality as an additive approach where the goal is to prevent any axis from being neglected. For clarity, I'm going to stay with the first definition involving unique problems that are faced by people who are at the bottom end of two or more axes of oppression. The problems with axis of oppression. There are three problems with the axes-based approach. First, it posits consistent, unambiguous axes of oppression. Racism, for instance, must consistently take the form of one consistent oppressor class, namely whites, and one victimized class, namely people of color. For this to be true, we should have no evidence of pro-black discrimination— However, in a specific educational scenario, we have robust evidence of pro-black discrimination. This does not mean we should retire the idea that black people are oppressed or that pro-black and anti-black discrimination are comparable. That would be wrong-headed, but we shouldn't oversimplify things either. Second, intersectionality assumes that every intersectional effect is negative— The assumption here is that discrimination is always worse than the sum of its parts. 
Yet men who are both gay and black are perceived as more likable than men who are both gay and white. This does not mean it is easy to be a gay black man in America, but does show one positive characteristic that gets attributed to gay black men. Thus, not every intersectional effect is negative. Third, intersectionality ignores the influence of the situation. Intersectionality has been more heavily influenced by sociology than social psychology. Sociologists typically study big categories. A sociologist might study education and race, but it is unlikely to test variability across small educational situations. For instance, being African American might be an advantage when you apply to an undergraduate college, but it might be a disadvantage when you apply for a summer internship. It might again be an advantage when you apply to an honor society, but a disadvantage when you apply for a research assistantship. In these cases, the intersectional effect is not about two identities, but rather about an identity and a situation. I am not knocking sociologists for focusing on broad levels, but as social psychologists have been showing for decades, we need to consider the person-by-situation interaction. In fact, considering that oppression requires both agents, subjects, and patients, objects, we need to consistently consider the agent-by-situation and the patient-by-situation interaction. More complex interaction effects may occur. To use a contrived example, research may show that when applying to a science versus arts job in a liberal arts college versus a research university in the Northeast versus all other regions, gay Asian women are treated more favorably. This is an arbitrary interaction, but such interactions could be real and discoverable and tweaking either of the situations or the identities could lead to a different bias. Here, a bunch of situational intersections and an identity intersection meet to form a six-part intersection. When you bring in situational interactions, it becomes even more difficult to neatly classify people as privileged or oppressed along an axis of oppression. In fact, when you have information about the situation, it's fruitless to ignore the interaction between the situation and the target person. These problems aren't fatal for intersectionality. By discarding the construct of axes of oppression, scholars could describe general trends while also discovering intersectional effects or their absence by studying the people who lie inside and outside the focal intersection instead of making assumptions based on axes of oppression. Otherwise, we will go back to an era when black women are presumed to cumulatively bear the burdens of black men and white women but have no unique problems. Crossing the Political Divide Given the empirical status of intersectionality for whom we have Crenshaw to thank, it would be difficult for a scholar of any ideological background to discard the theory in its entirety. However, intersectionality will continue to become yoked to ideological battles if liberals neglect the problems with intersectionality theory— and if conservatives assume that intersectionality is only about progressive causes. Is everything intersectional, as some progressives say? That's an empirical question. In the case of voting rights, there was an era when voting rights were denied to all women, which was direct discrimination. There was no intersectional effect by race or sexuality. There was also an era when voting rights were denied to all African Americans in the South, which was also direct discrimination. There was, to my knowledge, no intersectional effect. A perusal of history would probably uncover similar cases where a consideration of interactions would miss the point. The idea that intersectionality is important can stand on its own empirical legs, without the need to append the axiom that intersectionality is pervasive. Should conservatives continue to dismiss intersectionality, or may it benefit them to consider its uses? <laughs>
assumed that the paucity of black conservatives in academia needs an explanation. A progressive sociologist might argue that there are few black conservatives in academia because of their low base rate in the larger population. A conservative might counter the liberal by stating that although academic hiring discriminates against religious conservatives, there is also an intersectional hypothesis to consider. A hiring committee is perhaps more likely to hire a black liberal than a white liberal, but less likely to hire a black conservative than a white conservative. The liberal might aver that no such interaction effect exists. An empirical study could settle the dispute. In this case, the conservative is making an intersectional argument, one that matters for them, because conservatives typically want liberals to acknowledge the opinions of black conservatives. What this shows is that intersectionality theory needs repair. The fewer flaws in the theory, the more likely non-liberals will be to take it seriously. Simultaneously, if conservatives and other non-liberals come to understand that intersectionality spans issues that are relevant to people of every ideology, new and useful research on intersectionality may be conducted. Richard Davies reading Chris Martin's blog, Intersectionality is a Political Football, Here's Why It Doesn't Have to Be. Now our interview with Chris Martin. Chris, thank you so much for coming on to Heterodox Out Loud. Thank you for having me. You have a long history with Heterodox Academy. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you decided to co-found HXA? One reason I ended up being involved in it was that I've had somewhat unorthodox opinions on political issues. And some of that comes from my international upbringing. Uh, I lived in Saudi Arabia for the first 10 years of my life because my father worked there. And then I lived in my home country of India for eight years. And after that, I moved to the U.S. for college. And I suppose I ended up incorporating ideas from several cultures as well as being somewhat skeptical of ideas from any given culture because I'd been exposed to uh, to so many. And especially in Saudi Arabia, I actually was not that exposed to Arab culture, but rather all the other expats that were living there. So I was fairly um, heterodox from the beginning. So it was an interest of mine. I ended up writing a paper on it for a class that I didn't expect to publish, but I ended up publishing it in The American Sociologist. I forwarded it to John Haidt, who saw it, and that's how we and a group of other people were connected uh, in 2015, and that's when we started Heterodox Academy. Well, that's great. So let's dive into this particular blog post. Can you tell us why you decided to write about this topic? I think the topic of intersectionality gets muddy, and also some people seem to have preformed opinions about it without actually knowing where it comes from. And I wanted first people to just understand what the term originally was supposed to mean. And second, I wanted people to understand that it's perspective that even though it's associated with progressive causes, is not intrinsically progressive or conservative or centrist or anything. It's a perspective that's important to take if you want to understand the world regardless of your political orientation. And if you understand the term well, then you can understand why it matters regardless of your political orientation. So my goal was first to just explain where it comes from. It's a a legal term. It comes from a case that anyone can understand. I want to transition just a little bit over to looking at the relationship between something that's often talked about almost hand-in-hand with intersectionality, which is critical race theory. And what is the relationship between the two? Well, I think people who tend to find intersectionality interesting also tend to find CRT quite interesting. CRT is actually a bit more of a psychological theory. It comes from the idea, well, it comes from critical theory, which has its roots to some degree in Friedrich Nietzsche, the German philosopher, who said that our, our cognition is, is shaped by our self-interest. So sometimes we, be, we believe certain things are true, not because we have enough evidence, but because it's convenient for our self-interest. So we're not really reliable perceivers of the world. We're not even reliable thinkers. When it comes to critical race theory, I think one point that critical race theorists tend to make is that sometimes sometimes 
this is in a U.S. context, white Americans perceive themselves or classify themselves as not racist because they don't notice the ways in which they are being racist. So they pass laws that, on the surface, look like they're fair, but actually still have some racist implications. And I think you can take any CRT article and you know consider its merits on its own, so you may or may not disagree. But I think we all know of at least one case where a politician or a law states something in a way that seems to be superficially fair, but in reality, a lot of cases slip under the cracks and the system is unfair. I think all of us have been part of a system where we weren't protected by laws that were supposed to protect us. CRT is is really focused on that um, that issue, and it's yeah, it's it's a perspective that is interesting to people who are concerned with discrimination, especially race and sex discrimination. And intersectionality is also a perspective that's um, or a, a worldview that's of interest to people who are interested in issues like discrimination. But I don't think you necessarily have to find one of the theories valid or one of the perspectives valid to be interested in the other. So I think the two issues are non-overlapping, and some people really just have an interest in one of them. That's really fascinating. I don't think that is something that I've I've really heard ever. <laughs> I also had not heard of CRT being originated from Friedrich Nietzsche, which I think is a, a really interesting point, and how it's fundamentally about we're not really rational thinkers, and we're biased towards ourselves and our own group interests, and that can cause problems when developing laws and other ideas. One of the other issues that has come up around intersectionality and CRT is how, in a K-12 context, how are these things being taught? And is it possible to teach concepts like intersectionality in a way that is not overly simplistic? I really don't know what's happening in the in the K through eight level at all, to be honest. But in high school, all over the world, high school textbooks don't really do a good job. History textbooks don't really a good job of do a good job of covering the recent past. I think part of the movement to get the issue of racism into high school textbooks is to have some recent development, so more recent history just put into the books. And I don't think many of the people doing that are familiar with critical race theory. I think what's going on is that some activists like Christopher Rufo are, are using the term critical race theory. They're just slapping that label onto anything involving doing a better job about educating students about the history of racism in the United States. And that history does tend to be shaped by people who are relatively liberal, I would say. Although if you look at historians and academic departments, and there are some conservative ones now, it's just agreed upon, regardless of whether you're conservative or centrist or liberal, that racism has just been a major force in U.S. history. You can't really push that aside. So I think what educators are trying to do is just incorporate that history better in textbooks. Yeah. And so in uh, within higher ed, you are a sociologist, and do you teach these concepts in school? Well, I'm both a sociologist and psychologist, and at the moment I'm in a psych department. So if students have questions about those topics, I talk about them. And intersectionality, like I wrote about in the blog post, is almost synonymous with the study of interaction effects. So if at some future point I'm going to teach research methods, I'm going to talk about how interaction effects really are the basis of intersectionality. But statistically, they're also kind of hard to understand, which is why sometimes you don't learn about how to do the statistics until you're in graduate school when you're doing a master's program. It really depends on what I teach, because I could potentially teach intro to sociology. But um, at the moment, no, I don't really talk to students about either of these perspectives. If you think about one aspect of critical theory, which is we tend to deceive ourselves in ways that are flattering to ourselves. In my happiness class, I do talk about that topic because there are many ways in which we distort our past and our present so that we have more flattering reputations in our own minds. So in a very, very loose sense, I talk about deception for the sake of one's self-interest, but that's about it. <laughs> 
What do you think is the best way forward? As you said, we should find value in these theories as it explains real and important effects. But how do we remove some of the ideological spin that has overtaken the theories and move back on focusing on those core type of principles, such as these are interaction effects that are real and valuable to study? Well, I think we need just need to pay more attention to the issues that I pointed about pointed out in the blog post. So um, I pointed to exceptions. I pointed to how um, sometimes even a single axis can be more complex than you think. I pointed to how the intersection of being black and gay, for example, or black and male can be in certain situations to our advantage. So um, whether it comes to textbooks or lectures, I think you should have an obligation as an author or speaker to point out these complexities. Um, and not brush over them. Sometimes people do that. So I'd say as an educator, just pay attention to the the published peer-reviewed research that's out there that actually shows that sometimes the intersectional effect can be positive. Sometimes an axis is just more complicated than you think. This is pretty mainstream research. It's out there. Just be aware of it and teach your students about it. Is there anything else that we didn't get to touch on that you would like to make sure our listeners take from your blog post? I would say just try to not stereotype topics. I think the topic of intersectionality has been stereotyped a bit. Then the topic of CRT has been stereotyped a bit. And CRT really is, in my opinion, a theory better suited to the legal world. But intersectionality, I just feel like people stereotype that word. They stereotype any word that is used a lot by social justice activists. And sometimes those activists pull a word that scholars have started using and don't understand it very well. Because sometimes if you are you know, skeptical of social justice activists and you hear them throwing around the word intersectionality a lot, you might think, oh, this is just a bunk idea. But in reality, there's more to it than you think. So just be heterodox. Actually be open to um, a new perspective. Be open to the idea that there might be more to this idea more to a concept than you think. Chris Martin on Heterodox Out Loud. Before you go, subscribe and download us wherever you listen to your podcasts. Davies Content produced this show. Thanks as always to Kara Boyer on our communications team. I'm Zach Rausch. Until next time. <laughs>